Um, so my name is Jordan Goldman. I am the engineering principal at Zero Energy Design. We are an architecture and engineering firm, offices in Boston and New York City and Portland, Maine. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so this kind of dovetails a little bit with uh, what, Cindy's, what Cindy said, but um, just to give you a high level view about where our energy goes, um, oops. Uh, buildings consume 40%-ish of our total country's energy use. Of that residential is 22%. So if we're going to get a handle on our addiction to fossil fuels and overall carbon impact of um, operational energy use, uh, residential buildings, and all buildings, in fact, are a good place to start. Um, so we take an approach, as our name suggests, we specialize in very efficient homes um, that are super insulated, that are net zero, that are net positive. And we take kind of a ground up approach towards, uh, towards the overall performance. So the first step is to invest in the building envelope. So we put much more insulation that would otherwise be required by code. We put very good windows in. Um, then once you've got this very efficient building, we specify the most efficient systems possible so that we can meet our reduced energy demand in as efficient a, efficient a manner as possible. And finally, we incorporate renewable energy systems such as solar panels um, to offset uh, the energy consumption. The idea is kind of analogous to the old recycling mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle, that the first step is to really you know, conserve energy, then consume it in as efficient manner as possible. And that leaves you a total energy use that might, would be otherwise much smaller. And any given amount of renewable energy will offset a greater percentage of a reduced energy demand. So here are some examples of projects that we've worked on. These are all super insulated net zero or near net zero buildings that are all electric, um, no fossil fuels. Um, so they can look traditional like, you know, homes in these homes in Lincoln and Wellesley. They can look modern like this home that we did in Lexington. Um, and this home in Brookline happens to be a, a, a renovation of a home on the National Historic Registry. So there's really no reason why these sorts of strategies and techniques uh, cannot be applied to any design, any type of home. Um, so when we think about the efficiency of the envelope, it's important to define what's inside and what's outside. And everything that's inside needs to be separated from everything that's outside with a continuous insulation layer and a continuous air barrier. This is to you know, reduce your heat loss through the envelope. We like to think of it at home as a six-sided envelope, meaning that you've got four walls, you've got a hat, which is your roof, and you've got a bottom, uh, whether it's your basement or a slab on grade, you, know, you need to have insulation on all sides. The image on the left shows a typical kind of code compliant wall, which might have R21 cavity insulation, which due to thermal bridging through the wood studs is operating more like R16. Um, the two images on the right, which are what we prefer, are thicker walls that either incorporate a double stud construction, which is really just a way of thickening uh, the total depth of the wall, or a single stud plus continuous insulation on the outside. That's what the bottom one is. So you've got a continuous layer of insulation over the entire framing, um, which kind of acts as a jacket for your house. So we start with really good cavity insulation. This happens to be dense packed cellulose, which is a plant-based material. And then we add to it continuous insulation on the outside. The image on the right shows a foil-faced foam material, which we are trying to you know, kind of get away from as much as possible due to the fact that foam is a petroleum derived product and there's lots of you know, not so environmentally components to it. The image on the left is a rigid cork board um, so obviously a plant-based material, much more kind of environmentally sustainable due to um, low embodied energy. All of our houses get a continuous airtight layer. Um, fret not, this house did have windows, it did have trim, it did have eaves and overhangs. Um, but we have this defined airtight layer uh, that serves to eliminate infiltration through the house which improves building comfort, building durability, and dramatically reduces your uh, operating energy. And then finally, we incorporate triple pane windows into all of our projects. Um, they perform much better because they're much better insulating and they don't necessarily look any different than a conventional window. 
These ones happen to be a, an inward opening European style window, but that is a matter of aesthetic decision. We seek to make all of our houses um, fossil fuel free and all electric. And I would say 98% of them utilize air source heat pumps for heating and cooling. This is an electric based system that operates essentially identical to a central air system with the key difference being that it can reverse its cycle and rather than you know, extract heat from the house in summer, which is the way an, AC, uh, an air conditioner works, it can extract heat from the outside air in winter and deliver that to the house. And as was mentioned, you know, these systems work down into the negative teens um, without any backup energy. You know, their efficiency does suffer a little bit, but um, you know, the net environmental benefit of eliminating fossil fuels is, um, is really advantageous. So here is a graph from an energy monitoring system. So this is basically you know, looking at the way a heat pump, an installed heat pump that we have is working. This happens to be Mark's house, who is gonna be speaking after me. And this is in Lincoln on February 24th, 2015. The, the green part shows the amount of energy the system is consuming. The purple line shows the outside air temperature, which bottoms out overnight at a negative 11 degrees. The system just cruises right along. And note that this was not an especially low outside air temperature unit. Um, this one was rated down to five degrees, but as you'll see, it performed just well, just fine, well below that. And what you'll also notice, my favorite part of this, is that because we invested first in the envelope at Mark's house, during the day from about 10 o'clock in the morning to about seven o'clock at night, when the sun was out, the heat turned off. And it's not that Mark turned the thermostat down, it's just that the house was kept itself warm and you didn't need any heat from the heating system. So, you know, when thinking about new buildings and new construction or major renovations, we like to design the envelope in a way such that the building itself, the house itself, does the majority of the work at keeping itself warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And then the systems are just there to supplement. Similarly, we use electric heat pumps for hot water as well. These are systems that extract heat from the air around them in the basement and deliver that to your hot water. If you have a house that, you know, I don't know, has a lot of AV equipment or you've got a separate um, fridge in the basement, there can be a really nice synergy in using the waste heat from that, those appliances, that equipment, that refrigerator or chest freezer and delivering that into your domestic hot water. So I mentioned the fact that we've got airtight assemblies for all of our houses. Um, that means that mechanical ventilation becomes critically important to maintain good, in, good indoor air quality. Um, these systems uh, provide a constant stream of fresh air, which is excellent and really important for occupant comfort. And these appliances um, recover heat and moisture that would otherwise be lost in the exhausted airstream um, as a way to minimize the energy impact um, due to ventilation. Of course, efficient appliances, Energy Star appliances, low water using dishwashers and washing machines and induction cooktops are, you know, we have found that induction cooktops are not just an acceptable alternative to gas in the eyes of our customers, but they are a preferable alternative to gas. So I know that the, um, that the initiative has an exception for, for gas cooking. I am personally of the opinion that that is misguided and it would be better just to require induction cooktops and, or other electric cooking and cut each of these new houses off from the grid and start to decouple houses from the gas infrastructure. But maybe that's a conversation for another day. Finally, LED lighting, it's much less expensive than it used to be. It's much better in terms of the, the color profiles of the bulbs. Um, you know, if any of you are still installing incandescent bulbs, please stop. Um, there are much better alternatives. And finally, renewable energy. So just about all of our houses get solar panels on the roof. And if the system is large enough, you can use excess solar production to power your car. So your house and your transportation can be powered by the sun. So, you know, we kind of talked a lot about the environmental benefits, but ho homes built like this are more comfortable because you have eliminated drafts. And because it's so well insulated, you've eliminated cold spots throughout the house. You can sit in front of large windows in the winter and be comfortable. Um, 
because of the, the continuous ventilation, you've got healthier indoor air quality. The build, you know, because of the way the building is built, it's more durable. Um, it is quieter because you're insulated from, from the outside. Um, and finally, you've got you know lower operating costs, lower operational energy, smaller carbon footprint. So I ask to all of you, which of these sound bad? Which which of these don't you want? Um, so you know, timing for doing this sort of stuff is obviously most effective during new construction when you can kind of design and build the building co quote unquote correctly from the outset. Um, but for those of you in the audience who are kind of interested um, homeowners, you know, and you already have a house, you know, we want to kind of time these things to make sense with the measures that you're doing. So if you're replacing your siding or your roofing, that's a really good opportunity to add rigid insulation. This home on the right, which is getting new siding over just, just over a building wrap with no extra insulation has lost a kind of generational opportunity to improve the, uh, to improve the performance of the walls. If you're replacing your systems, hey, a great opportunity and great timing to, uh, to switch to electric systems. Um, and just to quickly wrap up a quick uh, case study of Mark's house. Um, this is in Lincoln. Um, very high insulation R values on all the assemblies, triple pane windows and the, and the continuous air barrier. The systems are all electric using an air source heat pump, a heat pump water heater and an energy recovery ventilator for fresh air ventilation. And finally, a photovoltaic or solar panel array covers all of his, all of his energy use. And then he generates about a 70% surplus on top of that. So you know, that could be used for electric cars. Currently, Mark, unless you've, unless you've since bought an electric car, you know, he's just banking a very large credit with, um, with the energy company. Um, and so with that, I thank you for your time and I will hand it over to Mark.